Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for uh, who you are, that you are a God that we can trust, that you've revealed yourself to us. As we think about the importance of soul care and the mental health crisis that's occurring in our culture, uh, Father, we want to be equipped. We want to learn from you and from your word, and uh, we want to be a church uh, that has resources and the uh, availability and the ability uh, to step in and to uh, accomplish great things uh, for the glory of your name uh, and, and to be uh, uh, a church that you use to provide much healing. Uh, Yahweh Rapha, you are a God who, who heals. You are a God who makes us deal with issues. Um, you, most of the time, you, you're more than capable of snapping your fingers and making them all go away. Uh, but most often, uh, you make us deal with issues, issues of the heart, and, and you pull them up and, and you provide healing through your son. You, uh, your truth overcomes lies. Your, your truth uh, sets us free. That's why you came. Um, and we pray for this evening as we think about putting this into place and being so intentional as a church body. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are to uh, a spot in the semester where um, we're, tonight we're going to ask the question, what do we do with all that we have been learning? Okay, there's one more session left. Tim and Elaine will be back next week, and we're going to talk about identity. Uh, the identity truth in Scripture is is uh, one of the most powerful truths. So much of counseling we're going to talk about here in a little bit comes down to. Uh, confused identity and where we put our identity in the wrong spots. Um, so please come back next week as we talk about that. But tonight, uh, we, we want to ask the question, Pastor, as a church, where do we go from here? So one of the major reasons that we did this class this semester uh, is the belief that as the body of Christ, Scripture and the Gospel are sufficient, and that we, as the people of God, need to begin to speak into this area of mental health in all of our relationships, in, uh, in your conversations with your friends, conversations with family members, and uh, Asking the question, how do I do that? That was the purpose of this semester. Um, I, I know many people came because they, they uh, have issues that they want to deal with and they want to get freedom um, and were frantically taking notes and hopefully you have an awesome binder. Uh, but we also did it through the lens of saying, um, how can you, as a Christian, begin to uh, roll up your sleeves and enter into this space that our culture so desperately needs help with, okay? And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight is um, Daniel and I were thinking through, all right, we've, we've gone through a number of topics, but if, if you were just here for the this class, this semester, there is a certain level of uh, skill set that you've gained. Even if you don't, maybe you don't feel like you've gained it yet, but there, you've learned a lot of very powerful principles, and, and we're going to start talking about how to put these in, into practice, into place. So the first thing that I want to show you guys is uh, a, a general, this is, this is very simplified, but a general trend um, that allows us to deal with all of these issues that we've dealt with, okay? And so uh, we're going to put up, uh, we're going to put up, so how do you start to provide soul care with someone, okay? 
And this is, a, this is the quick overview portion, all right? So if you have your binder, you can flip back and you can be the star of the class, or uh, you can begin to, uh, uh, to answer out loud. We're gonna have a lot of interaction tonight, uh, but let's recall the, the very first step is to begin to listen in our conversations. Listen to the people around us. Okay? Most often, uh, in much of life, uh, we are not good listeners. Okay? Most of the time, we might be people that do most of the talking versus not enough listening. And so we have a whole session about how do you begin to engage someone um, in soul care? And the first thing you do is you listen. Now, uh, Miss Elaine gave us some uh, things to listen for. They, they call them entry gates, but in plain language, we would say, what are some words or some uh, key expressions that you might be listening for? as you are engaging with uh, with a friend you, you sat down for breakfast and coffee uh, what are some of those things might you be listening for what are things you hear when you go to a friend and she wants to vent or he wants to vent anger okay you might be listening for anger we had a whole an entire session on anger it may not come out in, in quite those terms. I am angry. It might come out in some other choice words. I'm really upset at so-and-so. And, and it gets really emotional, right? So there are emotional words. Um, there's a lot of, Elaine talked about self-talk, right? Um, a lot of identity sort of things. I'm such a failure. I can't, I can't believe this has happened. I've made a mess of my life and, and a lot of those sorts of things, right? So listening for how someone is communicating about their mental and emotional and spiritual state is the first step. So no matter what you do, the first thing you gotta do is, is listen, okay? The second thing as you begin to uh, deal with people is Typically, when you start to hear those uh, emotional words, uh, they, they've said, I'm angry about something, um, they're confused, right, is they need help, and this is part of your job as a helper, as a friend, to help them start to define what it is specifically that they're angry about, that they're anxious about, and help them to put their finger on the issue, okay? I would say uh, th this is one of the key works. Guys, this is crucial, and I know it sounds really simple, and I'm, I'm trying to, this happens all the time around you, where people, uh, see, most often we deal with surface level coping mechanism behavior. Things like substance, eating, drinking. People run to coping mechanisms. A lot of times people run to uh, binge watching TV, right? They overload themselves with entertainment. They overload themselves with social media. I want you to think of all the coping mechanisms that we have in our society. That's just surface level stuff. So when you, when you interact with someone and you see some of those things, and, and you were to ask them, hey, do you know why you always turn to such and such? You know, most of the time, they may not know. For you to be a good friend and to, to help in soul care is to begin to ask just probing questions. Why are you so anxious? You know, what, is, is there a pattern for why you turn to overeat? Is there a pattern? And, and you have to know someone delicate enough to, to ask these questions. But Tim and Elaine gave us a whole host of really good diagnosis questions 
that oftentimes they sound really simple, and I'm just telling you, it's really powerful stuff. So as pastors, we get a lot of counseling, and overwhelmingly, just asking uh, pointed questions like, why are you angry? Can you put your finger on what exactly it is? Most of the time, the first thing that comes out is not real clear, okay? You know that, right? It's just not real clear. And then it's part of your job to kind of help them to define that with clarity. And we have a whole host of great questions. Yes, well, sometimes they, they, they don't even know they're angry. Yeah, that's great. She, she said sometimes people don't even know they're angry. And so another one, just thinking through that one, we were using anger, but... One that you're likely to get, right? If you've got somebody, you know, and there's like, I'm overwhelmed, right? I feel like I'm, I'm drowning, right? I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed. Well, what's overwhelming you, right? And they may give you, well, this, right? But you just keep digging in and it, you may start to realize, well, okay, you're, you're way too busy. Well, what got you so busy that you now feel overwhelmed? And you start to realize you're, they're kind of running from something, right? That was their coping mechanism. They filled their life with so much busyness right, to try to forget about it. Um, so you just keep peeling back layers with questions uh, to just let them process, right? So you never, like you were saying, like that first, that first answer, the first question you ask, if you say, why are you blank? Or what is the problem? If you ask it that way, the first answer is probably not going to be the root thing. Right? You've got to continue just to let them process. And that's where that first one ties into the second one is you can't rush it. It's going to be a process, right? You may have to spend, you know, a whole a whole coffee session, right? Just letting them work through it and be like, okay, it's okay, we got through that one. Oh, but there's another layer below that, isn't there? And let, let's keep working until we get down to what's called the root of the problem. Is. So it is going to take time. And it is just a lot of listening. But uh, Psalm 19, verse 12 says this, Who can discern his own errors? Acquit me of my hidden faults. Guys, we don't often know what's going on in our own hearts. Okay? There, there are hidden Faults, and who can discern their own errors? If I, if I could discern it that well, I wouldn't be in this mess. So when you talk to someone, they're going to give you an initial surface level answer. It's part of soul care. It's part of being a good friend. It's part of this training. Keep digging. Keep digging. Keep asking more potent questions because you will start to realize, number three, begin to distinguish the truth the, tr the truth and lies that are there. There's truth and there's lies. So if they're angry, remember when we walk through anger, there is righteous anger that's in the scripture. But then there's also sinful anger. And a lot of times people need help sorting through. Yeah, it's okay that you're angry about this. That's okay that... that but don't you understand that you have turned it into this? And then beginning to help them to distinguish, okay? Uh, similarly with uh, anxiety and fear. There's natural fear. There's fear that has an appropriate level that helps you assess uh, functioning in, uh, in, in, in our fallen world, okay? Natural, healthy fears, right? That I, I won't let uh, my 10-year-old daughter just walk around downtown by herself, would I? No, that, that's a natural, reasonable fear. But then there, there is sinful fear where uh, particular situations, the fear has begun to grow and grow, and, and it starts to uh, hijack your view of life. It starts to overwhelm you. And it grows, that fear grows bigger than your view of God. And so this whole idea of then as you help someone distinguish between what is true and what is a lie, okay? Um, and then you begin to start answering with help, help from Scripture. What does Scripture say about that? As we deal with our anger, as we deal with our fears and our anxiety, what does Scripture say about that? 
Um, and then as you work with a friend through this, and even after you say what the scriptures say about that, don't leave it at that. Begin to assign homework. Because you may say, what does scripture say about that? And they'll, they might not know very well. They might, well, scripture says, I shouldn't be so angry or I, I shouldn't be so fearful. Okay, well, let, let's start Let's start a research project. Let's, let's start finding verses on overcoming fear and how God fights for you. Let's start finding some of those verses. And, and then let's pick one out that becomes your memorized sword. Okay? You know, the scripture says that the word of God is your sword, and, and you need uh, you need scripture memorized for, for the moment of battle. And, and it can't be all of Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Uh, if you could memorize all of Ephesians chapter 1, and that's not particularly going to help you in the moment of battle. Uh, that would take a long time when most of the time your temptations, your situations are quick. You, you need to oftentimes condense those memory verses down to something that can be pulled out immediately, okay? Now we're talking about, look, look we've gone through here, we're talking about some practical help about how each of you can help your friends, your family members, okay? Uh, so what we're gonna do here in a second is, is we're going to walk through a bunch of scenarios. And you guys are going to participate, and we're going to walk through uh, how to do this through the different scenarios. But there's one other thing uh, that uh, we wanted to talk about first. Daniel's going to do this. And just in terms of, uh, uh, let, me, let me state it, and that is, I, I know you're interacting with your friend or your family member, and, and you begin to, to talk about these things. Never assume that they are uh, great at reading their Bible and having a quiet time all the time. And so before we move there, I just want to encourage you as you look at this list before we move on from it. I hope as you see it, it's like, this is something I can do. I can be present. I can sit and I can listen. I can ask questions. I can, you know, let the Holy Spirit then use it to help them recognize issues in their heart that they need to discover. Right? There's not like you have to have some specific skill um, and, you know, extensive training to do this, right? This is just being intentional to show up and don't ever underestimate how much God can use that because when you just show up and listen and care and ask questions, it gives so much value to that person, right? And then, and that just creates firm ground where the Lord can begin to work in that person's life, right? And when you give like the research process, hey, let's look at scripture together, right? You may be sitting there listening, thinking, I'm not sure I know good scriptures to give you, right? But we can look them up together and we can do these things. So I want to try to help break down some of those hurdles that we might, might be in front of us, those things that cause us to hesitate to step in and, and show up in people's pain and struggles. You know, the Lord can use you, and sometimes what he uses more than anything is just, just you showing up uh, and, and being someone to listen to help them process stuff out loud. But this is incredibly important. Uh, Jason and I were talking about this even today that, yes, sir? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, you're good. Someone asked, do you uh, say a certain Google. <laughs> it's amazing. I promise you. I mean, I have Bible software and stuff, but Google works. If you turn, if you put in a keyword and then you type Bible verse, there are there are key websites that have already done. They will be at the top. It, forgiveness Bible verse. There will there will be sites that come up that say thirty Bible verses about forgiveness. Uh, I was just going to say, there's a, a book, uh, it's called A Quick Quick Clear Reference Guide to Counseling by John Bruce. And it's a, uh, categorizes different topics of struggles that people struggle with. And it's a, 
And Daniel's going to say that again over the yeah. loudspeaker. Quick reference guide. Quick scripture reference. Quick scripture reference guide by. John Cruz. Oh, John Cruz. Our quick scripture reference guide for counseling is the name of the book. It's it's broken down topically like that. So yeah, and and yeah, and if you don't have access to that, right? Yeah, pull out your phone and just Google. Right? What the, what does the Bible say about? And there will be sites, and and you will know as you start to look through those the ones that are most helpful and the ones that you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know about those. So, but it's a that's a great place to start. Um, easy, easy to use. Here's one of the things Jason and I were laughing about this today. It's very easy um, to, especially when someone comes to to meet with one of us to talk about something going on in their life, a struggle they have, to assume that they've spent time in God's Word, they have, they've made this a matter of prayer, right, that they have put work in to, to work on it. And so sometimes I have been guilty over the years of starting way too far down the road uh, in trying to help them work through an issue when really the first question I needed to ask was, how often do you get into your Bible? When is the last time you read your Bible? Or another way to say it, hey, do you know how to feed yourself from God's word? Right? Because sometimes people will say, oh, I read my Bible today. There's a difference between just reading words on a page and knowing how to actually study your Bible, how to get, how to get application from it. Right? So those are two very different questions, but they are both very telling questions, um, and they are great questions to ask. Uh, another one, do you know how to journal as you read your Bible and as you pray, right? Sometimes just getting your thoughts onto paper as the Word of God, as you're reading it and letting the Word of God just transform your mind, and as you're praying, writing out those things that you're praying, those things that are on your heart, right? that is a very healing, helpful thing, because you start to see those things that you're thinking, and it kind of starts to help you expose the lies you're believing and what the truth of God's word says. So those are those are important questions. And then a fourth one that we put on here, do you allow yourself the opportunity to hear God speaking? Right? How often do you just get still before the Lord and just stop? But right? all of those are it's very easy for us to assume that someone has done those things, right? And, and the reason they're talking to us is because they just kind of get dead ends and they're not sure where to go. I find so many times, so many times, that it actually, this is such a telling thing, that no, they're not doing this yet. And so you can't start too far down the road. We've got to come back and say, okay, well, we can start to work on those things, we can start to try to um, identify the root problem. We can start to say, what are the lies you're believing? How does the truth of God's word, you know, expose that lie and help you help you remove it from your thinking? We can, we can start to do all those things that was on the last slide. But while we're doing that, sometimes the best thing we can do for someone is just start to help them get into God's word hold them accountable to be reading God's word, right? Say, we're going to read something together, right? And I want you to write down your thoughts on, as you're reading it, I want you to write down what it says and how God's speaking to you. And then we're going to talk about that. That is the, that is the homework I give nine times out of 10. Very first thing is I will pick a book I will, of the Bible. I will pick a chapter and I will say, I want you to read it every day this week. And here's the question I want you to ask yourself about what this says. And I want you to write down every day. And then when you come back, we're going to talk about your answers to that. So that is such an important step that every single person in this room has the ability to do, to ask that question and to, and to even start. So sometimes I think we overcomplicate it and we start way too far down the road when it could very simply be we're not letting our minds be transformed by the word of God. And if we would start there, right, the Holy Spirit would begin to speak. To speak. So, you know, I would feel overwhelmed if you ever came on to do that way. And when I look at the way Jesus encountered people, one of the great
great sermons that were heard by him in Arthur C. Bucket. And times the sermon, he was present in his presence when the woman touched his garment and all the other people around him. He felt, he felt that presence. Learning to be, I think, present in myself in, in my relationship with God, my relationship with Christ, my relationship with my family, being present is so important. And it is, does take the art of listening and then sharing with that person there in the immediate seat of his experience and listening. Because if I, I think it, there's a lot of people. Well, I'm Mike, if you'll let me, we're going to go through some of these scenarios and, and we'll talk about exactly how you'll have opportunities to get input on each of these scenarios. So, so uh, last thing I want to say, setting this up, we, we've picked five different scenarios. Hopefully we have time to get through those. Um, uh, we have, certainly there will be scenarios that will be above your pay grade, right? We haven't picked trauma, okay, or, uh, uh, yeah, or depression. And, and what we're saying is, look, if you've gone through these, these 10 courses, uh, each of us should feel comfortable and competent in starting to step into this space. It, it, uh, we want you to have courage to try that out. But if you're dealing with someone who's been through deep trauma, we recommend them to go with someone a little more experienced and you can push them up the ladder, that sort of thing, okay? So here's the first scenario. Um, you sit down with someone, uh, best friend, uh, she happens to be a woman for, for coffee over breakfast. And she begins to unfold a tremendous sense of guilt. You can, you can sense it in the conversation. It's been weighing heavy on her. Uh, you probe a little more and, and come to find out uh, she cannot forgive herself for the fact that she has had an abortion. Okay? Statistically, in the United States of America, almost one in four women have had an abortion. Okay. In this scenario, where do we begin? You're there at breakfast with her. Let's start to walk through what does this look like. Did we know she had an abortion? Well, yeah, she told us. Yes. Yes, yes. We, she told us she had an abortion. She cannot forgive herself. For that. What emotion do you think you should begin to uh, exhibit with her? First of all, Ashley said it's easy to not forgive yourself. But you've been in that same boat. Not in that circle, but in that same scenario, it was difficult for you to forgive yourself. However, truth then leads to the scripture. Okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, what emotion do you think you should express towards her? You understand? Empathy. Empathy. Compassion. Compassion. Right. But abortion's a sin. Jesus forgave no. us from our sin. Should. Which one of us hasn't sinned? Okay. Now, you guys are intuitively responding well. Let me remind you of the scripture passage, right? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now, I exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, and uphold the weak. So, in the scenario I've given you, uh, you're dealing with someone who is already expressing the emotions of remorse and regret. Therefore, you don't need to bring the hammer uh, because the conviction over sin is there. Now, if, if you happen to be sitting in a different situation where someone is haughty and arrogant towards uh, sin and that action, then then it is a different time for correction, right? But the, uh, the wisdom of the scripture, right, is look, you don't need to be the heavy hand because she's already showing 
remorse and regret. And so you, you meet her as you guys have intuitively talked about in terms of, okay, I have sinned too. I'm going to meet you with the compassion of the Lord as we deal with, with sin. Okay? Yes, yes. So I think there's a sense of showing empathy and um, pointing her to the gospel and the forgiveness that she can know, but addressing that you need to repent of your sin because then her heart's going to repent. Yeah, so if you couldn't hear, the statement was uh, don't we need to address sin and call it sin, right? In no way, please don't hear me say, we just say, that's okay. But we start to point towards the gospel and what the gospel says and does with our sin. And then that call to uh, repentance, that is to turn away. Uh, briefly, in this scenario, typically when people are remorseful, I, I said she cannot forgive herself uh, for this sin. Uh, she needs to be reminded of uh, the magnificent nature of the gospel, right? Let's, let's, uh, let's pretend in this scenario she is a Christian, okay? So we don't have to go through where you need to lead her to the Lord. Let's, let's pretend she is a Christian and she cannot forgive herself for an abortion. Now, what truths, how do we begin to separate truth from lie? And this is part of your good point in terms of as you separate truth from lies, okay, what is truth about this scenario? Huh? Okay, well, yeah, I would even back it up with the previous statement that yes, what you did was a sin, but yeah. So yeah, that was I was going to say that is that we are we are identifying yes and saying this is a sin. I think one of the things sometimes people know, right, especially if they're wrestling, right, if there is conviction, if they're under conviction, they're wrestling with remorse, having a difficult time. They know the weight. And they're feeling that way. When we say that's okay, I think a lot of times what we're doing, we're almost preventing them from dealing with it. It is, is there so, there's much more hope in this statement as opposed to saying, hey, that's okay. It's much better to say, no, you're right. That it, it was not okay, right? That sin was, it, it was sinful, right? It broke the heart of God. But listen to me, the truth of the gospel is that Christ took that sin and he paid for it for you, right? I mean, there is so much more freedom that comes from the truth than just trying to make someone feel feel better. And I think that was kind of getting to your point, right? To say, yeah, that, that choice was bad. That choice has consequences. That choice was sinful, right? And, and we are not excusing that. The Bible doesn't excuse it. We will call it what it is, right? That it is sin. That is true. But the but even greater truth is that Christ became sin for us so that we could experience his forgiveness. One of the, one of the greatest aspects of like genuinely understanding the gospel, like we we have a very a uh, shallow view of forgiveness. Um, most often when you, when you deal with people and you begin to ask them, like, <coughs> their view of forgiveness is that uh, everything gets uh, quickly forgotten, okay? Uh, it's like that growing up when, when you got in trouble with your siblings and uh, forgive your, your brother or your sister. And then it's, it's quickly just ignore it, pretend it never occurred. But that's actually, that's not biblical forgiveness. Biblical forgiveness is 
the reality that Jesus became your sin on the cross. The holiness of God stared straight at your sin, didn't call it anything but sin, okay? And by the way, the holiness of God is greater than anything you or I will ever think towards sin. But he stared straight at it and poured out his wrath upon his son so that it could be forgiven. Forgiveness is paid for. So when you begin to unfold the depth of the gospel, that as heinous as anything you'd ever done, that that was actually paid for. That the God of the universe stares straight at your sin and still says, my son has paid for that. That's genuine forgiveness. And it's, it's so freeing because then at that point as people start to understand that you can say and if, if God punished his own son for your sin so that you could experience forgiveness right? don't you think it breaks his heart for you to continue punishing yourself right, and not forgiving yourself when he paid such a high price to forgive you, right? I mean, it, it helps them to process that. It's Well, I, I even say it stronger than that because uh, I have dealt with this scenario of unforgiveness repeatedly throughout my years of being a pastor. And so I, I've developed, I say it very sternly. I will look you right in the eye and I will tell you, you know, once I understand you're a believer, I've explained the gospel to you, and then I will say this. I will say, listen, when you continue to beat yourself up over that sin and you cannot get forgiveness because you won't forgive yourself, you are spitting in the face of Christ on the cross because you are pretending like it took what Jesus did plus your own self-mutilation and carrying this thing around. Okay? I, I say it that hard. Do you want to keep spitting in Christ's face? Well, no, obviously I don't. But but sometimes that, that language needs to be so, so potent because the reality is it was never about uh, uh, you uh, ever being able to do anything good enough. It's always been all about Christ and then, and then accepting that grace. Yes, I keep, there's a question I keep playing in my mind as I'm hearing all this. No, wouldn't it be nice if you could just say to her, is there any, what caused all this, you know, this situation that you felt that you needed to have this conversion? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, it would get into deeper issues. This is the same though. We'll keep it simple. We'll keep it moving. Well, Great question. I feel like I'll die for this woman. <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> right. All right, we're going to move it on to uh, scenario number two. Um, this is uh, uh, this is a male who's struggling with anxiety and panic attacks. When you sit down for lunch, uh, he begins to unfold to you that uh, he has a new boss at work that is extremely aggressive and puts him on his heels, and he begins to panic every time he's around his boss. And additionally, he, he, uh, had, he received a poor performance review the last time, and uh, he's, he's very worried about his future at the company. Where do we begin? Yeah. I have been there. That's been you, Don. I had a heart attack at 30 years old and didn't have any clue about what to do except go to Christ. And if it hadn't been for Christ giving me the, the freedom and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and understanding His love, I would have never been able to make it. Amen. It, as you begin to help them to clearly define issues, 
what sorts of issues might you expect to find in your friend's heart over this? Okay. Fear of man over fear of God could be a, a root behind that anxiety. Sure. What other heart issues might begin to be unfolding here? Fear of loss. Loss of what? A job. Okay. So provision. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there, there could be a, a fear of provision. Okay. Uh, this is my job. I've had a bad performance review. Maybe I'm not meeting up to snuff. Okay. Why am I not meeting up? Because I want to get over that. Am I, am I praying well enough for this decision? Okay. There could be there could be fears of inadequacy. Maybe I'm not good enough for this job. We're we're quickly getting into uh, areas of. Uh, who am I as a man? Do I have what it takes to uh, succeed? Um, these identity idols that creep up in each of our heart is that uh, we, we are our performance and whether I'm good enough to be able to perform and meet standards can often cause a great deal of fear uh, very deep down there. Oftentimes, I've found that that root cause goes all the way back to early childhood. How did your father respond to you? Was it on sports teams and some of that stuff? In terms of, am I enough? Do I have what it takes or do I shrink back? Is there lots of fear inside there? What you have to ask the court to know is the analysis correct? In other words, are you way over your head in what you're trying to perform? And be honest with yourself because in the work world, you run into those kind of people all the time. If they've gotten into a position that they're not qualified. Well, sure. And so, if you couldn't hear Paul said, uh, maybe, maybe some of this is true. Maybe he can't actually measure up, right? And so, now let's enter, so we explore possible issues of the heart, okay? And for you, the, the reason we're exploring these issues of the heart, it is, it is important for you as a counselor friend to, to have discernment in knowing what common issues of the heart are and to be able to ask intelligent questions, never leading questions. You want to find out if this is really there, but if you can ask good open-ended questions to help someone identify the issues of their heart, okay? Um, then we begin to separate truth from lies, truth from lies, okay? Um, this scenario could go a hundred different ways, but, uh, you, you know, we, we could take Paul's scenario where, uh, yeah, the truth is you're really not uh, cut to, to do it. Uh, and, and you can say, all right, all right, truth, but the lie would, would then be that, uh, well, I, I don't have uh, provision. What is what is going to happen with my life and all that stuff? So so let's say that's the case. Let's let's say uh, maybe they're not cut out to be, uh, if Danny was here, he would tell me I, I wasn't cut out to be an engineer. Those who can't engineer preach. All right, and so, um, so let's say maybe he wasn't cut out to be an engineer and, and he's thoroughly confused about what he's going to do with his life. What sort of scriptural answers would you then begin to unfold? Do we, found, do we find our worth and value in what we do many times? So if someone tells me, if someone tells you, tells this guy he's bad at what he does, what might he be dealing with? Well, in this performance review, he was told he was bad at what he does, and there's so many times our value is connected to what we do. So what what would he be dealing with then in that moment that's causing this anxiety in his? Yeah, these identity issues, right? That I am my performance. Is that who you are? 
that what the Bible says? says? Is that what the Bible says who you are? No, who does the Bible say you are? You're a child of God. I, uh, in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, you have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Don't you know who you are? And so you, you have to answer these issues of the heart. Maybe you struggle with provision. Does the Bible say anything about our provision? Yes, what does it say? Yeah. Yeah, so so Matthew 6, right? G Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, and I know all this other stuff. And, and then Jesus gives those object lessons. Look at the lilies of the field, look at the birds, right? Your father knows you need provision. I am your provision. Right? That's a, those are issues of the heart, right? That, that get right to the reality of life. And then can we apply scripture? Because we know those are there. Let's deal with another one. Quickly. Uh, let's say the, the other week I gave you guys uh, in a sermon, if you happen to be here, that my father was angry over his season of life. He was no longer uh, the provider he was no longer, he was now an empty nester, and, and he spent so much of his life working hard, providing for his family, and now that season of life is over. His kids were doing great, okay? And the fact that they're all independent, they can feed themselves and have jobs and all of that stuff, but this different season, all of that changed, okay? And, and now he was angry. Where do we start? Okay, asking questions about can you define your anger, right? Let's let's put our finger on it. Why are you angry? Okay, and then start to press down in some of those. You know, a lot of times I, I would tell you, like it's not like the first time I asked him. Why are you angry? It came out super eloquent and all, right? It just come on, I'm mad. I'm just mad at life. Uh, yeah, why is it no, no, no. Right? That's 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 the way we are. You, you gotta you gotta massage, you gotta ask those questions, you gotta get down and, and begin to expose like what are the real heart issues? Okay. What do you think some of the heart issues there were? Okay, a lack of gratitude for the current season. Okay, that are there things to be thankful for in the current season? But a lot of times we, we spend a lot of our time looking back, okay, because we miss other seasons. Okay, there, there's, there's a sadness. Sadness is based on loss, right? I've lost something. I've lost probably purpose. You know the deep heart roots of purpose? Okay. I, I could feel that purpose, and now I have a sense of loss for purpose. What does the scripture tell us about that? The angry comes in the heart. A lot of it. Sure. <coughs> but what would what what are answers scripture gives us to help us with this? Is there purpose in each current season? Absolutely. Yeah. Does it change? Yeah. yeah. Do you have to refine it? Absolutely. Yeah. But there's purpose now. Yeah. Right? If there is a breath in your lungs, there is a purpose. Okay. Also, if you will recall from the sermon, let's see how many of you were paying attention. Uh, right? The longing for the past a lot of times will will never be regained until you get to heaven. And some of that is actually a longing for eternity, okay? And so unfolding that in, in our hearts is written the, the truth of eternity, and then saying, hey, you have something to look forward to. You're, you're gonna be fixed. You're gonna have that purpose. God made you to have that purpose and wanna work hard. And I know you can't now, but, but guess what? Can I show you and unfold for you that in heaven you're gonna get to work and that purpose will be restored? So sometimes it's directing them forward. 
to be controlled. Uh, we get angry when we think we've lost control over a situation. Um, and so, does scripture talk about control? Does it talk about who is ultimately in control of our lives? Right? So many times I think, you know, we, we have a false sense of how much control we really have over things. And so, when we feel like we're losing control, we're angry about losing control. When the reality is, we're never really in control in the first place, right? The Lord was in control. Um, you know, the season was different, but I think sometimes that's the one, right? Just pinpointing, like, hey, the fact that you think things around you are out of your control is yeah. what is causing you to react. Do people ever get upset about the political landscape of a country? <laughs> <laughs> they don't then sit, sit around and spend yeah. half the day just, just cussing about the government. Old women do that too. Old women do that too. Are <laughs> good to know. That's good. a control issue, right? What is the answer for that? What is the answer for that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat. Vote them out. <laughs> right. We get all that. At the end of the day, right? It is right. to pray and to trust the Lord. The Lord is in control. At the end of the, this world is not your home, okay? Yes, fight for our country. Yes, believe and, and see the beauty in it. And I'm as patriotic as anyone else. The greatest country on the planet. I mean, this world is not my home, okay? And God is in control. And God is in control. And as we're praying, as we're trying to you know, to, to let those things go. They're really practical things, right, that we can encourage someone to do or ourselves. So this is more, you know, this one's hitting really close to home, and you're like, I think you're talking about me, not that guy that uh, who's angry. Like, changing what you're listening to, changing the, the, the voices that you're hearing, right? You know, where are you getting your information that's causing you to, to be angry? Sometimes cutting that out for a season will help you regain perspective and bring that anger level down. That's, I mean. If it's like during the day, if you're listening to the Christian music, are you listening to the news? Yeah. All the difference in the world in your own attitude. So you know, if you couldn't hear Elaine, she says that it's, it's what you're listening to, right? If you listen to the cable news cycle endlessly, do you know what the cable news sells? No, they, they sell fear, guys. They report on fear. Do, do they have an agenda? Okay, do they find stories that meet their agenda and only tell those and cycle them over and over? They're selling fear, okay? But does the Bible say anything about um, our thoughts and what we should focus on? Yeah, it, it does, right? Anything that's good and pure and noble. Right? Think on these things. Things. Why? Because because what happens to you when you watch cable news cycle all day long? You get fearful and angry. Right? Watch what's coming in the eye hole and the ear hole. Okay? Like if you spend 30 minutes watching the news, maybe you need to spend an hour in your Bible, right? Just to regain to regain the perspective. Um, it's 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 so important. Like those little things are are so helpful um, to, to gather stories. And, all right, we're short on. Uh, we had a couple more scenarios, but we don't have time because we're long talkers. And hopefully, this was fun and interactive. I want to end with this, okay? Um, and that is, I want to. Uh, I want to continue to ask this question, where do we go from here? So I do think there's an aspect where every believer should begin to get trained and equipped to do what we just did and to think through scenarios, to listen, to be able to ask good questions, to decipher truth from lies, answer those lies with the truth of Scripture and to memorize scripture and to have those readily available scriptures and everything that we have just said, these scenarios, John said, hey, that was me, okay? And I, I told you real life examples that happen 
all the time. That said, so I do think we need to be a church, and we're going to continue to be a church where every one of us get equipped and to continue to offer resources like this. That said, I do think that having gone through 10, 12 weeks, whatever this is, that the Lord is also going to begin to call some of you to say, I think I'm gifted this way. The Lord has wired me this way. And now I want to speak to you and I want to start to press you and tell you, I think the Lord is calling us as a church to begin to get more and more biblically trained Christian counselors. Okay? Let me set the stage for you. What if? So Tim and Lane, by the way, uh, have a biblical counseling uh, program and certification process. It, it basically takes three major steps, um, and uh, uh, so the first step is, is uh, another course like this that involves uh, watching some content on. Uh, uh, some videos and meeting back together and discussing that as a class. And the second step is, is uh, reading some books that we gain knowledge. And then the third step involves uh, some, uh, uh, some observation and counseling hours. Okay? So here's the picture. What if on Wednesday nights at First Baptist Birth, two years ago, We had a meal, we had recharge, and then as we broke up into classes, First Baptist Bernie had five to ten biblical counselors who were ready and available for the community or anyone in our church for free biblical counseling. First steps of free biblical counseling. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Lane uh, sent me a, a Facebook post. It was here in our community. It was Bernie Area Informed Citizens or Moms or something like that. And here was the post. It said, I've got a junior high son who's, who's grown uh, uh, angry and distant from me and his father. And... Uh, we tried to send them to the school counselor. That did not work at all. And, and so we looked into professional counseling, and we couldn't even come close to affording. It was way too expensive. <laughs> so the post says, do, do you know anyone who has affordable counseling? We need help. The first comment underneath said, I have no answers for you if I'm in the same boat. This is a calling for the body of Christ in a culture that is in an absolute mental health crisis. Guys, this isn't going away. Okay? All the statistics are skyrocketing. Skyrocketing. A third of our U.S. population suffers from depression. A third. Okay, it's skyrocketing with the younger generations. What if we, as a church, as the body of Christ, God, because he has is, is gifted us and he sent us someone uh, with, with uh, an incredible program that's outlined to, to help and to put some things in place. What if the Lord is calling us as a congregation to, to have a number of you that begin to feel, you know what? I think I'm gifted in this space. I will take the next step. Maybe there are five or ten of you who are willing to take that next step. Yeah, I'll go through what's kind of like a college-level course for a couple semesters. I'll roll up my sleeves so that in two years, on a Wednesday night, this place is getting packed, right? People are having dinner. They love it. They go to recharge because they're short sermons. They love the short sermons. <laughs> 
And then afterwards, they're like, you guys offer free counseling? Could you imagine if on that Facebook post, my wife was able to go, you go to First Baptist on Wednesday night. They have men and women who are waiting there for you. And they will start with some free counseling. Maybe they'll have to push you up to some other. We have some other resources. Maybe they'll have to push you up. But they have been getting equipped to be able to meet this need of our culture. Could you imagine what that would look like around here? That's the press. So, <coughs> there is an informational luncheon on Sunday, December 17th. That is going to give you the details of this next class that is going to begin in the spring. Okay? It's going to begin in the spring. This is an informational luncheon. Let me just tell you up front, the church is going to supplement and bring this cost down to a very affordable price for you. Okay? We want, we are desperate. We're setting aside money for this because I think it's such an important need. Okay? This is going to be a free lunch right after church, December 17th. You guys have been through this on Wednesday nights, but there may be other people in our church who need to be at that lunch and like, okay, free lunch. People love free lunch. They love short sermons and free lunches. <laughs> Go to that lunch. Continue to cast this vision. What is the Lord calling us to as a church? Because I genuinely believe that the body of Christ is the answer. Okay? We are the answer. We can roll up our sleeves. Yes, some things may be above our pay grade. And you're happy to pass them along. But there is so much of these scenarios that, guys, we're dealing with all the time. And the Lord may be calling some of you to take those next steps, to get trained, to go through some of those counseling hours so that this can be a ministry that God is calling you to. Amen? All right. Daniel's going to pray for us, close us out. If you uh, if you think that is you and you want to make sure uh, that I tap you on the shoulder and make sure you're at that lunch and heaven forbid you can't come to that lunch, but you want to make sure I get your information, there are a lot of those little notepads. If you would write your name and, and just uh, stick it right here with contact information, I will make sure any information that goes out uh, uh, make sure you have it on, on when that class is and when all of that is starting, okay? Yeah, you can pray for us. So, Father, tonight as we wrap up this time together, um, God, I pray that you would continue to stir our hearts, um, God, to uh, give us the courage, uh, the, the confidence to know that you are with us, uh, and God, that you will go with us, you will go before us and behind us, uh, and you will use us as we step into the, the messiness of life um, with family members and friends and co-workers and neighbors. And God, help us to remember that we don't have the answers. The answers are in the gospel, and we will be faithful uh, to just point people to you. God, there's hope and there's healing found in you, and we may be the vessel you want to use. So God, if nothing else, remind us of that as we leave here tonight. Uh, God, continue to just even our understanding of the truth of the gospel and how it does affect our mental health and, and our care for our own souls and those of those around us. So God, continue to do what, what you have started here. God, we do pray for uh, for this ministry, God, that you seem to be just beginning to birth here at, at FBC. God, to raise up a group of people who are willing to step into this space uh, and to help care for those who are hurting, uh, to provide hope uh, in, in, in scripture uh, for them and answers to the things that we live with. God, would you just even now begin confirming for people uh, whether this is a step you are calling them to. God, help them to overcome any fear, anxiety. Help them to know that, God, if you are calling them, them to this, God, you will equip them uh, and enable them to do this. Uh, and God, may we more than anything just glorify you uh, and be obedient to what you're calling us to do. Uh, as we continue to be a light on the hill as a church and for 
like, oh, you're going to be in those OnlyFans, and she's just so 